We're just appreciative of you coming out, appreciative of you being here, and I just want to take a few moments to say thank you for that. I'm going to invite Star Parker, our president, and again, I don't... <laughs> Wonderful. By the way, as she's coming, the one thing I know she'll say, you didn't say your name. I don't know if I said that. So I, I always forget that my name is Derek McCoy, and uh, yes, Reverend Derek McCoy, and uh, I serve as the Executive Vice President here at Cure, and we got some great people here, but now I'll say Star Parker is the founder and president of Cure. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, this is overwhelming, and, and why I am so thankful to the Lord to be here in front of you just to say thank you for making a dream come true is because it's under ministers like you that I learned the lessons of the Lord that he says that he will write a vision in your heart and then you are to then make it plain so that men will run with it. And I did that after living a very aggressive life in criminal activity and drug activity and sexual activity in and out of abortion at clinic after clinic. God then finally started following me. And after the fourth abortion, I determined in myself I wasn't going to go into one of their so-called safe, legal, rare abortion clinics ever again. But I hadn't changed any of my patterns. And so I was pregnant again within a very short period of time. And that child was born out of marriage. And I ended up on welfare for the next three and a half years, watching my life unravel into a little dark hole. And I went into a business in South Central Los Angeles, and I met some gentlemen who had been sitting under the ministry words of people like yourselves, who had been born again, who had a deep understanding now of the principles of the Lord. And when I went in there to try to talk them into paying me under the table so that I can continue the life patterns that I was living and to uh, just supplement my welfare check without telling the, uh, the state, they said they didn't pay like that, that they were legitimate businessmen. I challenged them, and they challenged me back. I challenged them with everything I could think of, that all the things I had heard from people that, uh, that wore the same color skin as I did, that told me all of my life that, First of all, my problems were somebody else's fault. They also told me that uh, I didn't have to mainstream my life because the country was inherently racist. And I began to buy all of these lies, that including that poor people were poor because wealthy people were wealthy. And in buying all of those lies, I began to challenge them. And in challenging them, they said, you can believe all those lies if you want to. But we don't believe that. And your lifestyle, frankly, is unacceptable. And when I asked them about unacceptability of my lifestyle. They said, it's unacceptable to God. After I'm giving them all of the excuses for what in our community we have grown accustomed to thinking it's now our culture, uh, they didn't accept it. And when they said, God, I got out of there, because then I started thinking about my life. I started thinking about the breaking and entering, the armed robbery, and the men. And I went back to my same life patterns, but that brother who sat up under a ministers just like you can't calling me to go to his church. And when I went into that church one day after a couple of years, I've said a million times that if I had known a lawyer from the ACLU, I would have sued him for religious harassment because he was bothering me. And he just kept on. I didn't know any lawyers then. I know a lot of lawyers now because I work here in Washington. And they actually remind me of the people I used to hang out on the street corner with. And that's a whole nother story. And it's one of the reasons we're here to drain the swamp. But I didn't know any of them then. And so finally I went to church and I heard the gospel. I heard what you in this room have dedicated your life to. I heard that God was in Christ, that he was reconciling himself to the world, that he didn't count my sin against me, that he loved me, that he died for me, that he wants to set me free. And in hearing that message, I became born again and I began to change my life. And over time, I began to get, uh, go back to school. I got a degree in marketing and international business. I started one in Los Angeles. And after the 1990s, to Los Angeles riots destroyed my business. I, um, I wasn't going to go back to welfare 
because by then I saw the hand of the Lord. I saw what God can do when somebody will just take a moment to trust him. And I remember depositing more money in, in a week uh, in my bank account for my business than the welfare had sent me in a year. And so I trusted the Lord once again, believe in the message that you deliver all of the time over your pulpit. And, um, and, and I just continued to move forward. He ended me up in radio a little while. After a while, I decided I can't talk about these problems. We got to solve them. Because what I also began to see was that I was not an exception to the rule. That this culture that I had bought into was now permeating in all of black America and it was becoming the norm. And the data was just too clear that we had gotten off track from why God would have our ancestors enslaved to come to this great miracle of a country to then end up where we're back in chains, but this time the chains of the government. And so I began this work uh, to say, if we can change public policy, then we can change lives. You change the law, you change lives. And so in trying to change lives here, one of the biggest challenges we have is those politicians will do what they want to do unless there's a constituency that forces them to do something else. The biggest challenge for black America is that entire representation of the black community here in Washington, D.C. doesn't want any changes so that you will be free to, sell, to put the gospel of the Lord in people's hearts. So I thought, well, instead of trying to change all of those 49 congressional black caucus members, which you won't be able to do overnight if people don't have a clear understanding of what they're, A, doing here, and B, why it's inconsistent with scripture, then perhaps we can build a constituency within the community to get those changes. So we began to build this clergy network to say if the pastors have a deep understanding, they will then tell their constituents and their uh, their, you know, their congregation, what's going on? And then we will be an army of the Lord to go in here and change laws so that we can change people's lives. That's what CURE is. That's what we're here for. We have three programs. We have our clergy program. We have our media program. But we have our policy program, which is where we are going. And so when the Lord sent Derek McCoy, Reverend Derek McCoy, who at the same time he's beginning to energize to say, it's not enough just to put out these fires, which many of you now know. We've been in a culture war, so you're working and issues of marriage over here, issues of abortion over here, little issues here, there, and everywhere, where it's overwhelming the body of Christ now. If we could, instead of just putting out these fires, we go take the matches, we then can heal our society. And how you take the matches, that's right. You take the matches through public policy. And so that's what we are here to do. Derek has been incredible to then go tap Reverend Tim Lef um, Latif. Is he here? Uh, he's uh, in the room yet. You'll meet him later. You probably, in your, and most of you, that's why you're here. He tapped him. And, and, and the next thing you know, we built to the place where I am holding back tears to see each and every one of you that have flown in here, that have taken the time in your schedule to make sure that you're coming out here to feed into us and us to feed into you as an organization of ministers who understand that the time is now. Derek is constantly reminded of a scripture that talks about how the men will understand the times. The model that I began on was basically the Nehemiah thing to say, okay, here's how broken we are. And once you see that, are you willing to build with us? And then we're going to go and rebuild our inner city communities by rebuilding one life at a time. So I'm just, ex I'm just so encouraged to see each and every one of you that now you're bringing your friends. I started out walking in the room to go table by table, and I started that table, and I don't even think I made it to another table. So I will hope that over the next two days, please grab me. I'm available. Let's just talk, and you're not bothering me at all. I don't do anything else but this. And so. This is, um, this is a good thing. Yes, we're very, very grateful uh, that the, the Trump negotiated to the place that they did so that we will be able to come here because they also saw the need. They saw that if you, uh, wait, you really? No, you're talking black people want to come to the Trump Hotel in Washington, D.C.? This is a photo op. So we, uh, <laughs> so. And, and apologies, the vice president tried to do everything he could to get over here, but he's going to be out of town, so we, he will not be able to do it. And he said, can't you do it again? I said, yes, next year, so put it on your calendar. So, <laughs> but we shall see uh, if we get that opportunity to have the administration join us. I think there are a few officials that will be with us, and uh, just an entire schedule of wonderful, wonderful um, intellect and uh, touching your nation's capital. Uh, it, what's, what's really amazing is just uh, two days ago I was walking the, the, the mall uh, because 
our, the chairman of our board, who I think, uh, the chairman of the board, and in fact, I'd like all of the board members to stand up, but John Bedrosian, the chairman of our board, his son is in town for the, yes, thank you, John, for the, um, And Mark Little, I'm gonna get the mark. And, Tig and Tigra, uh, his son is in town, and he's, this is the second time in D.C. And the last time he wasn't able to make it over to the mall, so I said we're gonna go over to the mall. And we're going to go to some of my favorites, not just Lincoln, but the Korea Memorial because that's my absolute favorite over there. And while I was there, there was a ministry there under a woman named Gigi Graham who was doing this ministry called Deborah's Voice, and it was just filling the entire space with just praise of the Lord. This is just this past Saturday. I mean, just praise. I couldn't help but stay there because it was just, and you could hear, and then I went down to, to the um, uh, World War II Memorial because I didn't want to leave, but I knew I needed to leave. And so I'm walking and you could still hear it. And so then I walked by the African American Museum and the music changed. And the attitude changed. And by the time I got to Pennsylvania Avenue, they were having a march of black women that was um, hosted by Black Lives Matters. And that's when instead of walking the other mile that I wanted to walk, I said taxi. So I wanted to, uh, but the reason I'm even bringing it up is just to show you the difference and how important your voice is uh, here in this city. So over the next couple of days, as Derek said, Get some sleep tonight because they will tell you that we will be downstairs and in those buses very, very early and you won't return here until your, your feet are hurting. Women, I think that if you want to wear heels, which you should because we want to always look cute, but if you want to put some flats in because when we get to, in your bag, because when we get to the um, museum, the Bible Museum, not the African American Museum, um, that we're, there's some time to, to actually, you know, move around and get out there a little bit and we want, want you to miss that. So if you have some flats with you, make sure that you tuck them away in your, in your purse uh, so that you can be comfortable because it's going to be a very long day. Uh, I'm taking more time than Derek probably wanted me to, but I felt that I needed to do that just to really strongly welcome you, to let you know that you are an answer to a lot of prayer, a lot of vision, that I have wrestled with the Lord uh, over the last 25 years to say, aren't there some isn't there a moment in time like when Elijah thought that he was all alone and the Lord said, no, I've got 7,000 men out there who haven't bowed to the Baals. And when he said that, God opened his eyes and then he tapped his Elisha. And I just appreciate my Elisha. Amen. She could actually talk as long as she likes. She's the president. So, <laughs> but um, let me do the one thing that I, that I was remiss in doing and before we get back to eating really quick and, and beginning to process over to the other side is we're going to pray for a moment. Lord, we just thank you, thank you. for this opportunity. And uh, we just so are so grateful to you, Lord, for your mercy, your grace, your kindness, your love. Lord, you've been good to so many of us. Lord, I'm, I'm so thankful as I look over to my right and I see my North Carolina folks and, Lord, the storms that they just went through and the hurricane. God, I just pray. We just thank you so much for everything that you have, been, that you have done because you are faithful. So, Lord, tonight as we begin this time, we just look to you as the author and finisher of our faith. We ask, God, that you would work in our lives and in our hearts. Help us to, one, grow in relationships. Help us to, two, learn about something new and some new information because we are transformed by the renewing of our minds. And so, God, you continually do that by showing us new things, helping us understand different things. And, Lord, I believe that you'll give creative ideas to actually change our communities and change our country. So, Father, we just thank you for this time tonight. We ask you to bless our food uh, for the nourishing of our body. And, God, I pray that you would strengthen the people that have come. God, that as they leave here, they wouldn't be siphoned of their strength, but they would be renewed and encouraged with their strength. And, God, that you would add strength to their bones, as it says in Scripture, in Jesus' name. Amen.